Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. As we celebrated Purim this last week, a lot of themes come to mind. God's salvation, His presence, and how it is often hidden. How God can use anyone, even a pagan king, for His own glory and purposes. Other themes arise, too, how Mordechai was elevated to become second in command of a pagan nation, with themes which mirror the stories of Joseph and Daniel. Purim is a lot of fun. We can get caught up in playing games, having a party, eating hamantashen. Purim is like a lot of other Jewish holidays. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. A tradition in Purim is to dress up in costumes. God is hidden through the story. His name is never mentioned, and as a tradition, we hide ourselves in costumes. In Hanukkah, we remember that God is even with us in the dark, when things never seem worse. And in Purim, we remember that even when he seems completely removed and absent, when his name is not even mentioned, he is still there. I would submit to you there is a lot more in the story that is hidden than just God's name and presence. Lots of the story is easily misunderstood if we take it at face value. We'll do a quick summation of the story in case you haven't recently dove in to the book of Esther. Chapter 1. The king, King Ahasuerus, over Persia, is throwing a wild party, and there is tremendous amounts of drinking and festivities going on, and at one point the king gets the idea to summon his queen, Queen Vashti, in her crown, to come before the men. This is highly suggestive, by the way. Vashti says no. The king's advisors say, we can't have your wife saying no to you. Imagine what would happen if wives knew they could say no to their husbands. It'd be chaos. You have to banish her. Crisis averted, King of Hushbrush. So he banishes her. Chapter 2, he's upset about what he's done. He gets the idea that we need to find a new queen. We're also introduced to Mordecai, a Benjaminite who is transplanted from Jerusalem to Susa the palace where he holds a position. The first thing we learn about him, besides being from the tribe of Benjamin, is that family is very important to him. It was his job to raise his cousin, Esther. And he takes upon that duty and he tells her, as she is selected by King Ahasuerus, do not tell anyone you're Jewish. Keep that to yourself. At the end of chapter 2, we have Bigthan and Teresh, door guards who have a plot to kill the king. Mordechai, with his job in the palace, overhears the plot. He passes it on to Esther, who is now the queen. Esther passes it on to King Ahasuerus. Bigthan and Teresh are hanged. Plot averted. The king is not killed. Chapter 3, we're introduced to Haman. Boo! For reasons unknown, he is elevated to second in command over Persia. We're not exactly told why, we're not told a whole lot about him, but at some point he gets the idea from the king that everyone should bow to him. Everyone does, except Mordecai. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Haman takes issue with Mordecai not <laughs> bowing, and as a highly irrational person, he decides to overreact and commit genocide and kill all Jewish people everywhere, because one would not bow to him. That is a bit of an overreaction. Haman also gets the idea, and this is a little twisted, that he casts lots, he rolls the dice on when he's going to do this. And there is, there's murder, and then there's something that's sadistic and twisted. And the way he uses this gives you an insight into what kind of a man Haman was. It's one thing to have a crime of passion, and most people can understand this. You have a crime of passion, you get caught up in a moment. Haman set out, and he used a game of chance in a way to pick when he would commit genocide. And this is a very dark way of approaching things, which gives you a bit more insight into who we're dealing with here. Mordecai learns of this, and he asks... Esther for help, and there's a bit of a back and forth. Esther is initially uncertain, because if you go to the king and you're not summoned, you could be killed. We are very unfamiliar with these kinds of practices in America. 
Esther eventually decides that she will go to the king when Mordechai reminds her that salvation will come from somewhere. You just get to choose whether you want to be part of it or not. Esther goes to the king and invites him to a banquet, chapter 5. Only people at the banquet, Esther, King Ahoshverosh, Haman, boo. They go to the banquet, and Esther won't tell the king what's on her mind. She says, please come to the second banquet. They leave the first banquet. Haman is enraged at Mordechai, and he plots to kill Mordechai himself. Chapter 6. The king can't sleep. They're reading the book of records to him. And he hears about the story of Bigthan and Teresh. She tried to kill him, back from chapter 2. The king says, what did I do to honor Mordechai? And his servants say, nada, you didn't do anything. At the time, Haman is looking for permission to come, have Mordechai killed. He comes to the king. They greet each other. The king says, Haman, I've got a question for you. Number two, Mr. Prime Minister, buddy. What should I do for the man whom I desire to honor? Haman thinks the king is going to honor him. So Haman pours out on his heart what he would want done. Bring a royal robe and a crown and put this person on a horse, dress him up as the king and parade him through the city square saying, thus it shall be done for the man whom the king desires to honor. And the king says, that sounds fantastic. Do that for Mordecai. Do you know who he is? Haman's furious, Esther's second banquet. Esther reveals that Haman has a plot to kill all the Jewish people and that she herself is Jewish and Haman is plotting to kill Mordecai as well. Haman is hanged. The Jews are authorized to defend themselves in chapter 8. In chapter 9, they destroy their enemies and the festival of Purim is instituted for all. And chapter 10 deals with the greatness of Mordecai. Parts of this story have been curious to me for a long time, and we'll tackle one specific piece that's always bothered me because I didn't buy the normal explanation. Why didn't Mordecai bow to Haman? The standard answer we hear is, it's sinful to bow to another person. Well, is it? For years I had a problem with this story for this very reason, because with that explanation, Mordecai seems a bit high-minded. A problem with his explanation is that it made Haman more relatable to me. Haman is basically a Hitler wannabe of the ancient times. I personally have a problem with a narrative that makes me look at any aspect of his logic and go, okay, I can see why he's upset. Then there's four issues we'll tackle on the standard explanations people come up with with why he didn't bow. Number one, the Torah itself. And we'll handle these one at a time. What does the Torah say about people bowing to other people? Well, a bit. Abraham bows to visitors. Abraham bows to Hittites. Abraham bows to people of the land. Jacob bows to Esau. Yaakov bows to Joseph, or Jacob's sons bow to Joseph. Bowing is shown throughout the Tanakh many times as a sign of respect, not worship. Saying that Mordecai didn't bow to Haman for that reason does not line up with the rest of Scripture. In Genesis, we have people bowing to each other regularly, and at times throughout the Tanakh, calling each other Lord, lowercase l. It's a regular thing. It's a deviation to say in this one instance in Esther, based on the text alone, that that would have been a sign of worship. A bow is about context. So we can't use that as a rationale. Number two. The Septuagint explanation is problematic, and I've encountered this a few times. For those of you unfamiliar, the Septuagint is the Greek copy of the Tanakh, and it can be useful at times, but it's not really the most reliable resource. And the story of Esther in the Septuagint has a few extra verses, which very much deviate from the standard text. In this Mordechai goes into a monologue and he says, You know, O Lord, that it was not in insolence or pride or for any love of glory that I did this and refused to bow down to this proud Haman, for I would have been willing to kiss the soles of his feet to save Israel. But I did this so that I might not set human glory above the glory of God, and I will not bow down to anyone but you who are my Lord, and I will not do these things in pride. That sounds really nice. 
Unfortunately, it does not line up with the Torah examples we used before, and this is in no other source text for the entire Tanakh anywhere. We have no other evidence this was ever part of the story, and in composition and in several places it deviates from how the rest of the text is written. And this is part of the benefit of having various copies that we rely on for, for translations. It's not enough to just change one thing. If someone changes the Septuagint, we have the Masoretic text, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's several other things. There's ways we can tell if something was changed. So we can't use this as an explanation. And also, in the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. No other translation carries it, therefore, we have to toss it out. Number three, the rabbinic explanations are lacking. And I actually really like the rabbinic explanation. It would tie everything into a nice bow, and this would be a very short drosh. But it's not so. It's problematic because in Esther Rabbah 7, and the Rabbah commentary is an early midrash, around uh, 300 to 500 AD, it states that Haman was wearing an idol around his neck or on his turban, and bowing to Haman would have constituted idolatry. This is really interesting, and we can, look in, we can look at it metaphorically in a lot of ways, and I really like this, because then Haman going around getting everyone in the palace to bow to him, and wearing an idol around his neck, it's like he's tricking everyone into idolatry. And this would make a lot of sense why Mordecai didn't bow. And I like this, except for one reason. Read the story of Esther. Is it really short on details? We're given horses going here, horses going there, someone was wearing this, they bathed with these oils. Here are the drinking policies of the palace. We're given a lot of details through this story. This would be a critical piece to bring up. And the book of Esther, the Megillah, is somehow absent on this detail. So I find that unlikely that something so key would be left out. Problem number four. The king's command. Mordecai was a servant to the king, and he held some sort of position in the palace. He was subject to the king's laws and decrees. He would have known going into this, into that position, what was expected of him. He would not have refused on these terms outright. And the king's command seems kind of clear in Esther chapter 3, verse 2. All of the king's servants who were at the king's gate including Mordecai, bowed down to Haman and paid homage to Haman, for the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Why? We're not given a reason here. So here's our face value problem. Mordecai didn't bow to Haman. We don't have justification in the Torah for this. We don't have it from other source texts. The standard rabbinic explanation does not offer sufficient evidence. And the king's command seems pretty direct. Was Mordecai wrong? Did Haman have a reason to be upset with him? Was he disrespecting Haman unduly? In his own palace, as an immigrant. Maybe Mordecai wasn't wrong. So many things in Purim are hidden. Maybe this one is a little hidden too. So let's take a closer look. In the Midrash, in Genesis, referring to Joseph, the rabbis connect the story of Joseph to the story of Mordecai in two very interesting ways. The rabbis wrote, one, that God moved the rulers, Pharaoh for Joseph and King Ahasuerus for Mordechai, to favor them, and the, that God did this by turning the rulers' hearts against their other servants. And the second way, it's an awkward translation in a few places, the children of Rachel, their tests are the same, their rewards are the same. And they connect the story arcs of Joseph and Mordecai in this. Remember, Mordecai is, from the tribe of Benjamin, a child of a son of Rachel. Think about the story of Joseph working in Potiphar's house. He was second in command of the home. He had everything at his disposal. He had all the credit cards. His name was in the bank accounts. He signed the checks. He told everyone what to do. He was top dog. But there was one thing that made him different from Potiphar himself, Potiphar's wife. When, we'll call her Mrs. Potiphar, attempts to seduce Joseph, 
This is his reasoning on resisting her. Joseph tells her, no one in this house is greater than I, and he, your husband, has not withheld anything from me except you, because you are his wife. And how should I do this great evil and sin against God? The one thing that made Joseph different from Potiphar himself is his wife and what happens next. And it says, and so it was that she spoke to Joseph day after day, but he did not listen to her to lie beside with her or be with her. We're not there yet. <laughs> Notice, and so it was, vayihi, day after day, yom, yom, he did not listen to her, veloshama. Where else do we have this abrupt beginning, and so it was, or now it happened, vayihi, where else, someone else is badgered about something, day after day, yom, yom, and where else do we have, he would not listen, veloshama in Hebrew. In Esther, when Mordechai is being badgered to bow down to Haman, it's the exact same words from Genesis to Esther. The text is clearly calling out and connecting itself to the story of Joseph when Joseph refused to sleep with Potiphar's wife. <laughs> this is really interesting. A very close connection in the Hebrew, and the rabbis picked up on this. Joseph's way of showing allegiance to Potiphar was to refuse the advances of his wife, and he seemingly protects Potiphar's identity or his dignity when he's arrested. He's, there's no record of him being arrested and being led off screaming like a madman. I was framed. Your wife tried to seduce me. He doesn't do that. Perhaps Mordechai was showing the same kind of allegiance to King Ahasuerus in his quiet refusal to Haman. And like many things in Purim being hidden, let's take a closer look at the king's command, what the king told Haman in the first place. In Esther 3, verse 2. All the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordechai neither bowed down nor paid homage. And there's a problem here, and it's a detail in the Hebrew. Who exactly was this command given to? We don't have an issue of a, a law being given or a, a broad decree. Kichen tziva lo hamelech. Literally, for so the king commanded him. By a straight reading, it looks like the king simply and possibly privately told Haman that, sure, others could bow to you. And imagine how that conversation would have gone down. Haman, we already know his eyes were on the throne. We already know that he was a fairly dark and twisted person through the rest of the story, telling the king, as your second in charge, I bring your presence where I go, your highness. It's really for your glory. Wouldn't it make sense that others bow down to the servant, to show honor to the master? And this is where a lot of paganism and idol worship comes up. God, the maker of heaven and earth, the whole universe. But we can't necessarily see him. So what if we worshiped the sun and the moon and the stars or the water? God made those. Isn't worshiping those the same as worshiping God? No, it's not. Those are two very different things. But that's the fallacy, that you can worship the maker, you can worship the person in charge by worshiping the servant. Haman falls into the fallacy of idolatry. So in that way, yes, there was an idol around his neck. Mordecai saw right through this. We have no record of a decree. There's no law given. And that went possibly between the king and Haman. So imagine Haman going around the palace, telling everyone, hey, the king says you're supposed to bow to me. And a lot of the palace servants would have said, mm, okay. And they might have gone along with it. <laughs> Just like Joseph saw right through the situation with Potiphar's wife, Mordechai saw right through Haman here. Haman was second in charge of the whole kingdom, and he had enormous power. But there was one thing that separated him from the king that Haman lusted after. It was to be honored as the king. Mordecai saw that, and he simply ignored Haman's, the king says you're supposed to bow to me too, comment. What does Haman do? If this were a, a real law, then Haman would have had real consequences for it through some kind of legal system. He wouldn't have had to start sneaking around, plotting genocide and assassination. 
Haman saw a people who would not assimilate and conform to just any system. Haman saw a people whose souls belonged to God. He saw a free people who would not make very good subjects for a tyrant such as himself. Tyranny and freedom do not mix. As Americans, this rings very true for us through our national history. We know tyranny and freedom do not mix well. If you are or have ever been active duty in the United States military, you are familiar with this line of reasoning that Mordecai was using. Because at some point, you've probably wondered what you would do if you were given an unlawful order. Now, I don't mean something that a lawyer could sit down and make some half-baked argument against. I mean something blatantly illegal, something unconstitutional. Some of you might be wondering why military veterans might have thought this through a bit more than others. Isn't the military a bunch of knuckle-draggers who just do whatever they're told? Not so much. Every service member, generally several times, takes the following oath. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. This is something that every service member has spent at least a little time thinking about. What do I do if I'm ordered to do something illegal or unconstitutional? Because the first thing in this is defending the Constitution against all enemies, and it specifies in home or abroad. The president comes after that, and then it's the officers over me. The president's not top of the list. So where's the line? And what do you do when you come to that line? Mordechai was given an order by someone appointed over him, which went against the throne. Even though the king didn't seem to know exactly what was going on, Haman knew it. Haman knew exactly what he was doing. He wanted everyone to honor him as king. He lusted after that power. He lusted after that glory for himself. He wanted to be king. And Mordecai, in his resistance, showed Haman a people the Persian Empire, in the Persian Empire, who would not make very good subjects for that kind of tyranny. Mordecai also made himself this one thing Haman couldn't have. Mordecai became Haman's forbidden fruit. He was that last stand in the palace, that one thing. He was that thorn in his side, that one thing he couldn't have. And that forbidden fruit is the one thing that separated Adam and Eve from God in the garden. God said, this one thing is mine in the garden. Don't eat it. We see that same forbidden fruit theme with Joseph in Potiphar's house. Haman had a forbidden fruit named Mordechai. You might be asking, what does this have to do with forbidden fruit? And I can feel the more skeptical among you saying, hey, the connection between Joseph and Mordechai, that's pretty neat. That it lines up like that, that's cool. Because that's what I thought when I discovered that. But the connection with the forbidden fruit seems a little weak. You could have used a number of analogies or metaphors, and they would have all worked. And sure, except for one thing. And for this connection, I give full credit to Rabbi David Foreman. Where is the first place that Haman's name appears in the Torah? And I don't mean Haman's proper name. I mean the letters Hey Mim Nun. In Genesis 3, God speaking. Hamin Ha'etz. From the tree? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And now the connection's a bit stronger. Haman wanting that forbidden fruit, the one thing he couldn't have, his name being right there next to that one thing Adam and Eve couldn't have. Let's take it a little bit deeper. Do you remember in the book of Esther when Haman is exalting himself to his friends and his wife Zeresh? Haman had everything, except it felt like nothing because he couldn't have that one thing that he lusted after, that one thing that reminded him that he didn't quite have everything because he didn't have Mordecai. And he's furious with Mordecai, his forbidden fruit. And what's that advice that he's given by his friends and Zeresh, his wife? 
Zeresh's wife and all his friends said, Let them make a gallows fifty cubits high, and in the morning say to the king that they should hang Mordechai on it, and go to the king to the banquet joyfully. The matter pleased Haman, and he made the gallows. What's the word for gallows? More specifically, and Zeresh's wife and all his friends said, Let them make gallows. Yasu eats tree. Let's take Mordecai, your forbidden fruit, your one thing you can't have, and hang him on a tree. Mordecai, where else do you put fruit but on a tree? Mordecai, all that stood in Haman's way of being honored as king in the palace, both in bowing and in swearing homage to Mordecai, that one last stand. Mordecai, that thing that reminds you you don't have everything that you crave, that you lust after, you desire. Haman knew that once Mordecai was out of the way, seizing the throne would be a lot simpler. But where do we get that Haman wanted the throne in the first place? We can see it in him wanting to be bowed down to, and that he was prepared to commit genocide against a people that seemed resistant to this. But there's another very key place that gives us a window into his intentions. After Haman got the idea to hang Mordecai, he was so giddy he went to talk to the king and get to direct permission to do this. And unbeknownst to Haman, the king had just learned that Mordecai had saved the king's life and nothing had been done to repay him. What happens next? Haman approaches the king and the king asks Haman outright what should be done for the man whom I desire to honor. Haman, assuming the king is referring to him, launches into exactly what's on his heart. So Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king desires to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and the horse on which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. Let the robe and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, and let him dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and lead him on horseback through the open square of the city, and proclaim before him, This is what shall be done for the man whom the king desires to honor. Look through this. And the words are bold, so it's a little easier. What does Haman want? Royal, king, king, royal, king, king, noble. What's on his mind? What's on his heart? What is he craving here? It wasn't enough for Haman to be bowed down to, to have the royal court pay homage to him, to have all of the authority of the king. He wanted the outfit. He wanted the gear. He wanted the t-shirt. He wanted all of it. This is the sin of pride and lust. And we often attach lust to something exclusively sexual, and it's not. It's craving something that God has forbidden. Craving something that you should not. And Haman embraces this, and he methodically conspires to get that thing that God has mandated he is not allowed to have. And we all know what happens in the rest of the story. Haman tells the king all these things he wants for himself. And his ironic punishment is that next he has to do all of it for Mordecai, someone he hates. And ask yourself this. How much more does Haman hate Mordecai now? How much more does he want to hang Mordecai now to put him, that forbidden fruit, on that tree? Sure, his hatred and embarrassment were probably both off the charts you notice the verse I had up earlier in Deuteronomy about how a hanging person is a curse of God? Rashi had some interesting comments on this, which feed curiously into the narrative. Deuteronomy 21-23, for a hanging person is a curse of God. Rashi writes, since a human being is created in the image of God, and God calls Jews his own children, as it were, the hanging body is disgraceful to God himself. It can be likened to the twin brother of a king who is a bandit and is hanged for his crimes. People see the body, think it is the king. That would have been Haman's power grab right after that parade. Hang Mordecai on the gallows dressed as the king. When did Mordecai have that royal garb taken back from him? Imagine Mordecai in royal robe with a crown on his head, hung on a gallows, on a tree for everyone to see. Someone might confuse that for the king himself, given the outfit and the crown. And that might make someone, that might put someone in a very convenient position 
Perhaps someone who had spent time, considerable time, getting the entire royal palace to bow to him, to pay homage to him, to swear allegiance to him. And I submit to all of you that not only were all of the Jewish people saved by God that day, but the entire Persian empire was as well. We see this theme of forbidden fruit in Genesis in the garden with original sin, with Joseph when he served Potiphar, and with Mordechai when he served King Ahasuerus. Haman's desire was to have it all. This was clearly not a godly desire, but a purely selfish one, completely self-serving. And if we're being really honest with ourselves, this is where Haman becomes relatable. Not because Mordecai's reason for not bowing was shaky, it wasn't, and Haman knew it. Haman lusted after power and glory that did not belong to him. He wanted something that was not his, and he knew never would be. What does Haman do when someone disrespects him? He immediately jumps to how he can get rid of this person, and everyone like him. Haman would have given Machiavelli a run for his money. Proverbs says, just as death and destruction are never satisfied, so human desire is never satisfied. Yeshua says in Luke 12, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. This is the exact way Haman measured himself. What's the next thing I can grab? How can I have more glory? How can I have more power? How can I make everything mine? There would have been no end to Haman's lust, even if he had managed to become king and kill everyone who stood in his way. It would have eventually destroyed him and everyone around him. Because when you start listening to that voice, it never stops. There is never enough money. There's never enough anything. It is written in the Bible, Therefore, if you worship me, it shall all be yours. Only the person speaking here is Satan. And this is the lie that he tries to tell us all. Puff up your pride. Build up your wealth. Give your life to material pursuits. Greed is good. The more you have, the more valuable you are. You are only as valuable as others see you to be. And we know these are lies, and they sound so pleasant because they feed in to our fleshly desires of pride and haughtiness and lust and greed. God's Word gives us a very different picture. Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, tells us to esteem others as better than ourselves, to be humble. And the Apostle John says in 1 John 2, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the Apostle James writes, But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. This temptation is one not from the Father, but from the world. And be careful. Notice what the Apostle James says, enticed by his own lust. Sin is custom made. And the enemy is looking for exactly how to custom make that sin to get you to stumble. Because what causes one person to stumble might not be a problem for you. I promise you there's something there. Would the music team please come up. In our fleshly nature, we are all programmed to want the forbidden fruit. We want what we can't have. And it's by the power of Messiah working in us through the Holy Spirit that we overcome this sin nature. Because if we're real with ourselves, most, if not all of us, have the potential to become like Haman. Let lust and power and our own pride dominate our lives. The more power and wealth you have, the more prideful you become, until the idea of someone else even slighting you becomes intolerable. But now, if you're Haman, you have the means to make them pay. The difference between most people and Haman, besides the hat, Haman had real power to do something to those who offended him. Most of us do not. You want to see what someone's really like? Give them wealth. Give them power. See what they do with it. Once you have the ability to do, buy, or influence anything, see how good of a person someone is. We see a hero in Mordecai and Esther. Courage, bravery, wisdom, and we all hope to embody these character traits. Let us remember what happens when power is acquired through lust and pride. 
Because that's when we get Haman. Please pray with me. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, our Father in heaven, we thank you for your wondrous salvation and how amazing you are. Lord, please forgive us for the ways we misjudge, for the ways we abuse relationships, for the ways we act hurtfully, spitefully, and lustfully, for the ways we puff ourselves up. Forgive us for wanting and craving things that we are not supposed to have. Lord, by you, all things are possible. And you who reside in us, you are greater than he who is in the world. As master, as the master prayed, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the glory and the honor goes to you alone, our maker and our savior and our king. Amen. Shabbat shalom.